Oh, you thought I was joking when I said what I said in my AC1 video, didn't you? Any news of Ada since she left? No. How sad. I'm sure you'll find her someday. Wait, what? Who, who the fuck is Ada? I'm just kidding, I know who Ada is. I'll see you all for a video on that in a week's time. Well, I wasn't. Enjoy. <laughs> Assassin's Creed 1 wasn't just Assassin's Creed 1. Well, wait, no, yeah, it was. But Revelations wasn't the first time Ubisoft expanded on the story of Altair. Oh no, you didn't think they just left him alone for four years, did ya? It's Ubisoft, of course they didn't. Everything is a cash cow, and they have to milk it, it dry. I'm making this video as a companion piece to my Assassin's Creed 1 video, link in the description. A spin-off of sorts. This is a video you don't need to watch to understand the AC1 video, but you should probably watch the AC1 video to understand this video. That's just like the game. Altair's Chronicles was released in February 2008 on the Nintendo DS, and later released on the Sony Ericsson Xperia Play, a platform I actually owned. I wanted to find my Xperia Play for this bit, so I could like show you and prove that I have one, um, but I, I couldn't find it anywhere. I text my dad, see, and he couldn't find it either, so I still have this bit in my script though, so... Hi. It's not even on the wiki page. Every release is listed here except for the Xperia Play release. And I know it's real because I fucking played it in 2011 when I was excited as shit for Revelations and on a holiday with my family in Florida. I remember sitting in the magic fucking kingdom playing Assassin's Creed, probably because I have undiagnosed autism. The game was a prequel of sorts to the first Assassin's Creed. I don't know why I said of sorts, that's literally what it is, and follows a weird story about a chalice, but it's not a chalice, it's it's a woman and people call her a chalice, we'll talk about this later, as well as allowing some backstory into Altair's life pre-AC1. In my script I wrote that's actually pretty cool and then I did a joke, um, after playing the game, uh, it's not cool, it's bad, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna explore that in a bit. Assassin's Creed Bloodlines was the other crucial piece of Altair related media, acting as a direct sequel to Altair's story from Assassin's Creed 1, releasing in November of 2009, right alongside Assassin's Creed 2, which actually worked out far better than you realise because Assassin's Creed 2 had Altair act as a central pillar of the storytelling. Ezio collects his codex pages, of which you can read each and every one in the database to see what Altair had been writing about, all of the inventions of which Ezio uses, the double blade, the poison blade, the hidden gun, were all taken from the codex pages written and created by Altair. Yes, Altair invented these things. Yes, Altair modified the hidden blade to keep the ring finger. I keep saying this, but people keep saying it was Leonardo. This man is a fraud. And not just that, but also the apple in Assassin's Creed 2, Ezio's apple, comes from Cyprus, and the characters talk about an archive. This is a place you visit in Bloodlines, you go to Cyprus, and you go to the Templar archive, and Altair continues to study the apple in scenes that play out often and mirror the Ezio diary scenes from Revelations. This stuff is so fucking cool, how all the narratives play into each other, but the game never points it out. I didn't even realise this connection until like two years after Bloodlines came out, when I replayed it and went, Oh my god, of, of course this connects, that makes so much sense. And I love that. Bloodlines acts as a sequel taking place a little bit after Assassin's Creed 1 and showing how Altair got on after the events of the ending of that game. <laughs> In this video, I plan to dive into both. Nowhere near as in-depth as my Assassin's Creed 1 video because I would be here for an eternity and because they're much smaller games. I wanted to make this video as a bit of a fun look back at a couple of spin-off titles more so than a full-on in-depth analysis because one is mechanically shallow and the other one takes all of its mechanics from the very first Assassin's Creed. However, I will look into the gameplay and story of each of these games, as well as how each game works to greater characterise Altair for better or for worse. I say that with certainty that it will be both better and worse in some areas, but I have no idea in all honesty. I'm writing this bit of the script in early March before we've even started work on the Assassin's Creed 1 video. I'm really not sure why I work like this, so let's just, just go with it. Altair's Chronicles is a game I played one time in 2011 and then never again, and since then, I retained the conclusion that I reached in 2011 when I was a stupid 13 year old that Altair's Chronicles was pretty damn good as a prequel to AC1. Now, in playing it again 12 years later, I have a new conclusion, somewhere along the lines of... 
What the fuck was that? Okay, that's not entirely fair. The game has some cool stuff in it, like that there's a few pieces of music that are only in this game and were composed by Jesper Kidd, and so they sound like unreleased tracks of Assassin's Creed 1, and that sort of slaps. I'll use them throughout this video, but if you want to just listen to all of them, I'll link a video in the description that outlines all of them. However, the game is mainly batshit fucking crazy, and I don't even know how at 13 years old I somehow absorbed this story and world building and went... Ah, oh, yeah, not bad. Because it's, ba it's bad. This game was a DS game, and so, of course, it's not much to look at. It's not downright awful either, although it's sort of a 3D side-scroller type game. I mean, if you've ever played the Assassin's Creed Chronicles games, China, India, or Russia, it plays similarly to those, because guess what? They were probably based on Altair's Chronicles. That's why they're called Chronicles. Like, this game is called that. It's in the title. This game was the goddamn template for one of the better stealth games that I've ever played. Maybe one day I'll make a video on that one, since nobody seems to have really played it, which I consider to be a sin worthy of execution. The game focuses, like Assassin's Creed usually does, on three core pillars of gameplay. Parkour, combat, and stealth. The strongest aspect of the game is the way that it uses parkour, but it's also what allows for the game to do things that make me want to go outdoors and enjoy a nice spring day in the sunshine. The parkour functions totally differently from regular Assassin's Creed and focuses mainly on pretty rudimentary platforming. I mean, why is this here? Imagine waking up and you look out your window and you see a man jumping between swinging boulders or giant Prince of Persia blades. I like to believe this is all canon. The parkour though can be fun as it slowly over the course of the game develops with the level design becoming tougher and the traps more troublesome. You go from pretty basic wall runs and jumps to mental triple flips that send Altair flying and a goddamn grapple hook. I'm sorry, a grapple hook? Why didn't Altair use this when he was assassinating Sabrand? He could have swung right over the goddamn docks. Using the grapple or ropes in conjunction with back ejects can actually be quite fun. Like this is the most fun that I had in the game, which doesn't look very fun, and it's not, but once you're three hours deep into this game, it doesn't really take much to make you smile. This game really likes using ropes too. You find yourself swinging like Spider-Man incredibly often, which is a sight to behold if I'm being completely honest with you. There's not a lot to say about the parkour system. It's like a very basic thing that exists and allows for progression to be made through a level, or sometimes for this to happen. And look, even if sometimes it's broken, or all the time really, it can also be broken in your favour, which really makes up for it when you think about it. You spend a lot of time in the sewers and a lot of time falling off things because the controls are horribly imprecise, and a lot of time pushing boxes around. Like, a, a strange amount of time just pushing boxes or carrying boxes and putting them somewhere else, or pushing boxes on people's heads and killing them instantly. Part of me feels like this was another game and that it was reskinned to be Assassin's Creed in the 11th hour of development. Your progression outside of story-based gear, like the fucking grapple hook, sorry I cannot get get over that, is done through Assassin's Creed's first ever skill tree. Yep, it was this game that did it first. People think that it was Unity with your silly little Creed points or whatever, but no, not at all. It was actually Assassin's Creed Altair's Chronicles for the DS with its blue orbs, its valuable blue orbs. I would like a 500 word essay from each of you on how these blue orbs function within the lore of Assassin's Creed on my desk by tomorrow morning. Please, thank you. You use blue orbs you collect from just walking toward the quest marker, or in little pots you can break, or from killing guys, to either upgrade your health bar or upgrade your sword damage. And every time you do upgrade your sword damage, it becomes a little bit fancier until it looks like something you'd find in one of Redder's Hecker chests. I, I guess this game kind of really was the template. Using the sword, you can engage in some combat, which this game really really loves. Now I spent most of my time avoiding combat by jumping like a crazy motherfucker past everyone in my way, although when fighting would be a faster strat, I whipped out my sword and hit them with the god of all combos. Y, Y, X. Also known as light, light, backflip kick attack, which is certified to stunlock your enemies and deal the most damage per second. I refuse to even talk about the other combos. They're pointless. They do nothing. They're a waste of time. Only ever do this one if you want to beat the game while the sun is still up and you have time to go outside and enjoy a beautiful spring afternoon. The game also has a counter system. If you guard and then you press attack when they attack, you counter, just like in Assassin's Creed 1, except 
not like an Assassin's Creed one because it's not a counter kill. It works more like an AC Unity parry. It just stuns them so you can finish them off. I rarely use this because offensive stuff always worked better and was much faster and reliable, but like, it, it is there. There is variety. In the game, you fight guards, harder guards, harder, harder guards, and Lenny from Of Mice and Men. Oh, okay. This is what we're doing. Right. That is reasonable. <laughs> as you progress, you get more gear to use in combat, such as throwing knives or the crossbow. So I guess that's also canon. Altair just lost it, which I guess makes the CGI opening to AC1 canon. But none of the items you really get mean anything. I rarely used any of them, and all you need is the grappling hook to pull enemies over and then do a ground finisher. It's kind of like Atreus's OP move from Ragnarok. I'm telling you, man, Altair's Chronicles was the goddamn template for video games as a medium. Sometimes you might even find yourself doing boss fights, and when you do, make sure to switch your brain off because they're just as mind-numbing as the rest of the game is. Don't ask why I'm fighting an assassin here, by the way, we'll get to that. This boss that reoccurs through the game with the basilisk, that's his name, is just a quick time event. You just mash the button that appears, there's no timing involved, just mash and rinse and repeat, there's literally no challenge, I don't really understand what they were going for here. And as for stealth, well, the game has you perpetually in high profile. You can switch to low profile by holding R, which is the opposite of what you're meant to be doing in Assassin's Creed, but we'll forgive these heinous transgressions. Holding R allows you to walk, which allows for you to creep up on sleeping guards to perform a stealth assassination, which requires a timed second press of the interact button after interacting so that you can stab them. And I didn't know that the first time that I did it, so he just countered me and forced me into combat. Altair also says some really weird things when you do assassinations, which I find incredibly funny to read. Do not be afraid, a better life awaits you. I'll see you in the afterlife, what the fuck? It's not really social stealth, but it sort of is social stealth. I don't know, maybe it's the only way they could possibly have adapted a system like that on the DS. And it could be kind of fun, like when everything lines up just right and you walk through an area and take out some guys, it's probably as Assassin's Creed as a DS game was ever going to be. I also think I killed this guy by walking into him, so there's that. There's also a stealth mission in this game where you can't be seen, in which Altair steals the disguise of a soldier and then a scholar, and then after completing his task of sabotaging the camp, he escapes by jumping into a catapult and flinging himself out of the camp. This is a real thing that happened, and I'm telling you, this is fucking canon. That's honestly all there is in the way of stealth, but on the same line of thought we have the integration of pickpockets and interrogations, which both utilize the touchscreen parts of the DS. For pickpockets, you have to like brush away the black to be able to see the pocket, and then carefully lift the key and take it out, avoiding hitting the edges or other objects like we're playing a game of Operation. It's just dawned on me that that reference might go over a lot of people's heads. Do people still play board games like that these days? Interrogations have you tap on the correct spot at the right time to apply pressure to your victim. And this is actually kind of hard. Like, it genuinely proved to be a challenge. Partly because I was playing on PC with a mouse and it doesn't really work correctly, but partly because it's just also a bit tough as well, I think. Overall, look, this game plays like complete shit. The monk blending is comparable to Valhalla, and it forces you into combat way too often. But it was really funny at points, so there's that. Plus, I did enjoy that time it made me back eject a couple of times. The bit that really got me though, is the story. This game's story is a complete, indiscernible mess that has no real conclusion, doesn't even really give us a purpose, and does nothing for our characters. It's like they saw concept art of Assassin's Creed 1 and went, I'm having some of that, but lacking any and all context for the thing they were using in the game. And it's never not incredibly hilarious. The game starts in vaguely the Middle East in 1190, one year before the events of the first Assassin's Creed, where a man of shadows is reaching his journey's end. I wish they called you a Man of Shadows more in Assassin's Creed. Actually, better yet, Bayek should have called the early Assassins that. Instead of the Hidden Ones, we should have been the Men of Shadows. <laughs> Altair arrives in Alep, which is the home of the Assassins, where Al Mualim resides. Now, if you've played Assassin's Creed 1, this should all be completely familiar to you. I'm not gaslight, you're overreacting. Al Mualim tasks Altair with finding an object known as the Chalice. Its role is to, quote, unite the factions of whoever holds it, the Crusaders or the Saracens. 
which I don't think that sentence makes a lot of sense. I've reread it like four times, and it do- it just doesn't make any sense. Like not on a plot or law level, just like as words in an order. Like it doesn't mean anything as a sentence, right? Unite the factions of whoever holds it, the Crusaders or the Sarah. What the fuck does that mean? Like obviously I get what it's trying to say. It's trying to say if the Crusaders hold it, they can get the Saracens to join with them and they'll like, I don't know, dominate the world or something. I don't really know. But like that's not what the sentence says, right? Like the the, the way they've like the gr- grammar in this like it doesn't it does the sentence doesn't mean anything. This does it. This doesn't fucking matter. And I quickly realized that this game does that a lot. It's sometimes as if it's been translated from another language poorly. Here Altea says, "I cannot do so of my own volition." in a context where, uh, what the fuck does that mean? Why? Or this Damascus informant guy who says, and I quote, a fine morning surprise. You are someone who walked the plains of God much more than those of men to act this stupid. You don't know when to shut up and show the respect some deserve. Old man, you say? Maybe, but look behind me at the chain of actions that I built. What the fuck is he saying? That's gibberish. I'm going insane. The quest is to find this chalice. Supposedly, it's in a desert temple that requires the use of three secret keys to access. And so we end up going from place to place to gather these keys so we can get to the chalice before the Templars. Which, by the way, are just openly a thing in this game. There's no secret brotherhood, nothing. Just openly the Templars are the shadowy organization. It just ignores Assassin's Creed 1. It doesn't exist. That game does not exist. So I guess that's kind of like standard Ubisoft in 2023. The first person we need to engage to find out more information is a merchant called Tamir, who lives in Damascus and has ties to the Templar. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. To get to Tamir, we have to take a torch that is conveniently placed next to a barrel of oil on the roof of his house and set it on fire. Also, talking about oil, there are sometimes just giant puddles of oil around that slow you down, you have to sprint through, they, they just exist. Once Tamir is out, we give him a talking to. He tells us about the chalice in the desert and the three keys, and then we kill him. So I guess it's not the Tamir from Assassin's Creed 1. There are just two Tamirs in Damascus that are merchants and also Templars. I mean, I guess it's not totally implausible. After a load of stuff at a circus where we gain another one of the keys from a Fajera who j- just has it, we arrive in Tyre and find ourselves needing to break into a hospital to find the one in charge of it called Roland Napule, who looks like this. Look, I'm sure it's just a coincidence. <laughs> I don't know what's happening anymore. Making our way into one of the rooms, I don't know where we are at this point. We kill Garnier, sorry, Roland Napule, and then we take another one of the four keys from this dude in the cage. We don't let him out though, he can stay in there and fucking rot. Another trek across Jerusalem and into the sewers leads us to Basilisk, who is the Templar leader of this region. That's just a thing. Honestly, Assassin's Creed 1's arc is so funny if you consider this game canon. When Altair figures out that all of his targets are Templars, it's like, dude, do you not remember the last Templar leader that you killed? Basilisk. You you fought him by jumping on his head four times. Dude, you don't forget these things. After a few attacks, we've acquired the key, and I guess that means the Templar leader can just remain alive, I suppose. There's no need to take his life. EXPLOSIVE BOMBS! I'M SORRY, WHAT?! At this point, we need a map to find the temple to find the chalice. So Altair does some pressure pad puzzles, don't ask questions, this is standard in Jerusalem, so that he can reach the Tower of the Evil Assassins. You know they're evil because their insignia is the assassin insignia, but upside down. (laughs) After fighting your way through to the very top, you have a final battle with the head of the evil assassins. And by battle, I mean you spam Y, Y, X until he's dead and we have the map to the chalice location. Working our way through the sand temple designed by God knows who, I mean who the fuck designed, who built this, we finally reach the- What? Is that the Ark of the Covenant? Don't be silly. There's no such thing. It's just a story. What is happening? Why is this here? Why'd they choose this design? Turns out Basilisk is already here though, somehow, and he decides to explain that the Templars have had Altair running around like an idiot because they actually already found and hid the chalice, and also the chalice is a woman and not an object. So it makes sense as to why Altair couldn't find the chalice this entire time. Women aren't real. The rest of the game is a bit of a wild goose chase of dashing around to different places, burning boats to stop the poisoning of Akka, which we get to see the siege of, it's kind of cool, and then Altair flinging himself on a catapult. 
Sorry, I just wanted to play that out again. That's, that, is a, that is a thing that happens. It's canon. The ending has us finally locate Ada, the chalice, and team up with her to help her get out. However, she believes the Templars have infiltrated the assassins, and Haresh is going to hand her back to the Templars. Altair goes to kill Haresh, which we do, but sadly, Ada is back in the hands of the Templars. Fighting through the docks and through plenty of Crusade Knights, we reach the boat where Ada's being held. Once reaching it, we do this fight with the Basilisk again, finally assassinating him this time, but not quite in time. The ship which Arda was on sails away as the fires caused by all the fighting makes it impossible for Altair to reach her. He simply stands on the dock, looks out at the sunset, proclaiming that he will find her. And that's it. That's the fucking game. Dude, what the fuck was that? <laughs> we never inform al Muelim about any of this. In fact, we never go back to see him. Arda's powers are never explored or explained. We don't know what she can do, why she can do it, how she can do it. There's a million inconsistencies with AC1's world building, and somehow, dude, somehow, this game is still considered to be canon. You know why? Because it's fucking mentioned in Assassin's Creed 2 in the goddamn codex pages. This is fucking insane, like genuinely insane that this is a storyline that is considered canon and Assassin's Creed 2 backed that up. Let me just read you the excerpt from the codex page, codex page 7. I had thought Arda would be the one to lead me to rest, that I might lay down my blade and live as a normal man, but now I know such dreams are best left to sleep. Her face, I try to banish it from my mind, as I remember the days and nights during which I chased her Templar captors across the sea. I almost got to them in time, almost, if I had only been faster. Instead, I held her lifeless body in my arms, saw the terror reflected in her fixed, unblinking eyes. I hunted each man, one by one, until all responsible were gone from the world. But there was no joy in this, no satisfaction or release. Their deaths did not bring her back, did not heal my wounds. After that, I was certain I would never again feel for a woman as I had for her. I am fortunate to have been wrong. And hey, this is actually pretty good, so I take it all back. I'm sure we can infer from later material that, like, most of Altair's Chronicles isn't canon, but that Arda was canon and perhaps her powers were just misunderstood. Maybe there were no powers, maybe the Templars were wrong. Although, it still doesn't explain why the Templars were the way that they were, since AC1 implies Robert's Brotherhood was the start of things. The AC2 Codex pages also reinforce this idea too, so the whole thing is just like one big old contradiction. I suppose all we can really say is that Arda was a character that Altair had feelings for at one point. She was taken, he tried to find her again, only for her to die in his arms. And that's the only thing that's really canon from Altair's Chronicles, because literally nothing else makes any sense in the larger context of AC1 or AC2. But I do like Arda's impact on Altair as a character, because it does actually explain why Altair would have become so jaded and self-interested. He was heartbroken by the loss of Arda, but also by the incident with Haresh. He felt bitterness towards the Creed, and so it sort of makes sense. I do just wish we had a game and a story that mirrored that narrative depth, because Assassin's Creed Altair's Chronicles is absolutely not that. However, after the events of Assassin's Creed 1 and after his redemption, Altair would in fact go on to find love again. He would rediscover what it means and that would strengthen him. And the origin of that is the focus of our next game, Assassin's Creed Bloodlines written by Darby McDevitt, so that's how you know it's gonna be a banger still! Okay, so I hadn't played this one in a while. I think the last time I did was in 2015. My Let's Play is still up, and I have no idea how that aged, so don't watch it. I said don't! And I'll be honest, I didn't remember the gameplay of this one being so... sticky? I think sticky is the right word. The base gameplay is pretty much stripped right out of Assassin's Creed 1, although it's lacking some elements like gentle push, because at the start I kept throwing random people thinking I would gentle push them. There's also no catch ledge, which is really annoying because the snap lock targeting of the parkour is far, far less accurate in this than it is in Assassin's Creed 1, and so you jump off buildings a lot, and not being able to correct yourself is a bitch. But beyond that, it's pretty much the same system as Assassin's Creed 1. The same counter kills, the same combos, the same everything really, even down to the blending. It all just feels far stickier. You always feel like your moves aren't flowing with your button presses, like parkour just isn't seeming to work with what you're telling it to do. The moves don't flow the way they do in Assassin's Creed 1. Although you can side eject and back eject, which 
wins me over pretty much instantly anyway. The issues with controllability though are of course thanks to the fact that this game was released on the PSP, which also means the camera movement wasn't possible the same way it would be in Assassin's Creed 1, because the PSP only had an analog stick for movement, and so you have to hold L and use the face buttons, triangle, circle, X and square, to move the camera up, down, left and right. Luckily though, I'm a hacker and use my Linux laptop to break into the mainframe and allow right analog stick movement in PPSSPP, as well as unlocking the frame rate to run at 60 FPS. It might not be authentic to the original PSP release, but I don't care, it's way more fun this way. I'll link the guide I used in the description. I say guide, it's not a guide, it's a showcase of the game running at 60 and the right analog stick cheat, but in the description is all you need to get it to work, it's really really simple. You also have to make sure it's the EU version of the, of the, of the game, it doesn't work for the USA version. And it has to also be on an emulator, it doesn't work on the an actual PSP. Which obviously it doesn't, unless you would like install an analog stick on it, I don't know. The setting of this game is Cyprus, both the cities of Limassol and Kyrenia to be precise. Both of which are bland and boring and uninteresting, but they work fine as like maps to jump around in for things to happen, which is fine I suppose. In these cities you have objectives you can complete, and these are essentially investigation missions. However, they've only gone ahead and added more types, from delivering letters from informants to robbing some keys or fighting some blokes. These missions are completely optional, however they do make up the majority of the main missions, so You'll be doing these random objectives, but within story context, and they're just as boring as they are in the open world. One of the reasons I said investigations worked in Assassin's Creed 1 was because of all of the elements of the game's DNA working in tandem to make them feel more valuable to your experience as you move through the game. The context of information and action and the immersion provided by feeling like an assassin, as well as the social stealth being ingrained into the act of simple shit like just walking around. In Bloodlines, these investigations don't do anything anything. There is no memory log, the base gameplay is pretty sticky and clunky and downright irritating at points, and there's little immersion because it's a fucking PSP game that could only render in two NPCs at once before it shit itself and went to sleep. And so, you're gaining no information, no context, no actual enjoyment from your actions, and so it's just sort of almost pointless. I said almost pointless, because you do get rewards in the form of experience points. You heard, you heard me right, I said experience points. This is XP which you can use to purchase skill points in the skill tree on the Animus menu between memory blocks. Because, oh yeah, you're also in the Animus in this game, but we'll talk about that in a sec. The skill points allow you to do things like increase your health, increase your damage, even your fucking crit chance, which I honestly find really funny. Ubisoft RPG-ified Altair in 2009 and nobody fucking noticed, and I find that really funny. I say as I'm crying real tears alone in my office. Also, it doesn't end there. Enemies have health bars. Well, bosses do. This game has boss fights. Every target is a boss fight. You don't actually do much assassinating in this game. You fight every single major temple Templar enemy in a Dark Souls style boss fight where you roll around the arena and deal damage, hopefully without dying yourself. It's a really, really weird game that I forgot played like this, because although it's got the base mechanical makeup of Assassin's Creed 1, it lacks any of the mission design or level design that made it fun, and will very, very often just throw you into open combat, even when you're trying your fucking hardest to do things in stealth, and god Damn it! I tried so hard. When they aren't bugging out, throwing knives are useful though for clearing areas. And what's even better is you can actually pick them up again. So like, that's a really cool improvement over Assassin's Creed 1 I feel. You only have three though, unless you level up your throwing knives in the fucking Animus skill tree. I cannot believe this is a thing that actually is, exists. Alright, let's just throwing knife that guy. Fantastic. Does the other guy notice it? Oh, you didn't realise he died. That's kind of sad. But no, look, the gameplay is absolutely not the interesting part here. It's serviceable, it's fine, the good stuff is all just Assassin's Creed 1 again, and the bad stuff is... I, well, I mean, we've talked about the bad stuff. The interesting part here is the story. Copyright Darby McDevitt, also known as God. And yes, people tell me all the time, but James, Darby wrote a lot of Valhalla, he was the narrative director, I think you should remove him from the pedestal. And to that I say, have you read the Bible? <laughs> God did a lot of things, I would argue, were actually really not cool, man. Like, making a guy kill his son to prove he's loyal, and then going, Whoa, 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 whoa I'm just, I, was jo I was just joking, I didn't think you would do it. Which is probably not that great, and would get you very, very cancelled on Twitter if you were to do that today. So, I'm just saying, even gods are fallible. The story itself, as 
like a story isn't incredible it's a basic story about a rebel faction with two members called barnabas and marcos which I will say it did send shivers down my spine. And they're fighting back against the Templars, all while Altair tries to find a Templar archive in Cyprus where Templars keep their Templar stuff. I don't know, like artifacts and books, I guess. It's the place in which at one point there must have been an apple because the Templars have it sent from Cyprus to Italy during Ezio's tenure as the main character of Assassin's Creed. Some could say, though, that tenure never really ended, did it? While all this is happening, Altair is grappling with what happened to Amal Walim, what he should do with the apple, and lugging around Maria, someone who goes on to have her own arc across the game. And these are the most interesting aspects. And despite the core plot being pretty wishy-washy, the interesting stuff, I feel, makes the game worth existing. And I'm not one to often say that, because most of this plot is really, really boring. But when it lets the characters breathe and talk, there's some really nice stuff in here. It's so completely Darby, even if it is on a PSP game that he wrote in his infancy working with the franchise. So what is the context for all of this though? Because we're in an Animus, right? Well, the game introduces itself to you at the start, not the game, the Animus lady introduces herself to you at the start, you being Subject 17, which is Desmond Miles. As well, when you're on the Animus screen, it looks like the Abstergo lab, which is very clear from the fact that the Abstergo logo is in the corner of the screen for the entire game. So I guess if we're to slot this nicely somewhere in canon, as it seems to be my job to make work, since Ubisoft clearly do not and never have given a shit about any of that, I'd say Desmond perhaps, like, accessed these memories when he was alone between sessions? Maybe he was able to do it at night or something? The only other option is that it's not Desmond and it's just someone else, but the voice just says Subject 17 and it's just wrong and a discrepancy in the script and it shouldn't be there. It honestly doesn't make a lot of sense either way. And that's Assassin's Creed in a nutshell, everyone. <sighs> Maria's story is one I really, really do like, though, even if some of it is a bit cack-handed in areas and clearly was restricted by the time they had to create this game and the fact that it all had to be packed into a PSP game that's entire purpose was to tie into Assassin's Creed 2. I'm not one to ever say the platform something is released on should ever justify poor writing because all you need to write well is a pen paper and talent. But I do think Darby was trying to get across some really nice ideas in a story that just needed to be bigger and more focused on Maria to actually achieve it incredibly well. That said though, the arc she goes on is still compelling, especially with the context of the Secret Crusade and Revelations. And honestly, the Secret Crusade adapts the story of this game and maybe does it better than this game does, if I'm being totally honest, because it's allowed to focus more on narrative instead of gameplay. But anyway, Maria has been sort of cast out by the Templars. After the death of Robert, she has no allies, but still believes in the Templars' goal of peace and order, believing the assassins want nothing but chaos. Falling in line with Altair by chance, he lugs her around Cyprus in the hopes she'll be able to lead him to the Archive. Maria, however, tries to escape time and time again and regroup with the Templars, who at this point want nothing to do with her, believing she's a traitor or a spy. There's like some clear disparity between Bouchard and Robert, given that he's a very different character in how he leads the Templars, and I refuse to get into a discussion again about why the Templars just exist after Robert, as if he wasn't the one who founded the specific Brotherhood that breaks away from the Templars, and why this doesn't feel like it truly makes any sense, that he'd just be able to be a Grandmaster out of nowhere. I'm not doing it again, man. I've had this conversation with myself too many times in the last six weeks. Verse 70 of the Founding Templar rule expressly forbids consorting with women, for it is through women that the devil weaves his strongest web. Disab ignored this tenant. Okay, so first of all, tenants? Second of all, though, is this a Templar tenant like in terms of the Holy Order or a Templar tenant in terms of the Secret Brotherhood Templars? The way AC1 frames this whole thing makes every other entry confusing as shit. I guess, like I said in my AC1 video, the Templars became the Templars over time, which sounds really stupid, but like, it's what must have happened, right? Robert's Templars sort of infected the actual Templars with the nine figureheads that oversaw a secret structure that just slowly worked to consume the actual Templars order until the time of Jacques de Molay where the public force of the Templars was completely eradicated but that only worked in the favour of those who acted in the shadows to truly solidify the Templars we see by the modern day. Fuck's sake, I said I wasn't going to do this again. The bit that I find strange is the scene where Maria comes to terms with what the Templars want and that it doesn't line up with her true ideals. Is it true what I've heard? That the Templars wish to use the Apple of Eden for ill? Not to enlighten the people but to subdue them? People are confused, Maria. 
They're lambs begging to be led. And that's what we offer. Simple lives, free of worry. But our order was created to protect the people, not rob them of their liberty. The Templars put no stock in liberty, Maria. We seek order, nothing more. Order or enslavement? You can call it whatever you like, my dear. Assassin! <clears throat> Apologies, Shalim. I let myself in. Oh yeah, Altair also has an accent in this game. It's better than Revelations, probably a sort of a bit, but nothing beats Philip. Nobody else has that presence and stoicism. This scene is like... I don't know, how did Maria not know what the Templars wanted? How did she really not understand that they were seeking order through control? I guess she was never really made an official member. She was just sort of like Robert's girl who was sort of manipulated and used, and it's kind of sad, actually. But even still, I don't know, the game doesn't explore this. It just expects us to believe she had no idea the Templars wanted bad things and was just good the whole time, but misunderstood the central components of the order she devoted her life to. So, yeah, look, it's a bit messy, but it pays off in the end. Maria eventually comes back to help Altair and leads him into the archive where we have a god-awful boss fight with Bushar who is not compelling and sucks and deserves to be killed and has no redeeming qualities like the Templars and Assassin's Creed 1 had. But what's nice is we get this little scene at the end with Altair and Maria on the docks where Maria speaks of how she's lost her purpose and needs to discover what to do next, heading east to India or wherever it ends up taking her. To which Altair responds with this really nice piece of dialogue. For a long time under Al Mualim, I thought my life had reached its limit and that my sole duty was to show others the same precipice I had discovered. Yes, I felt the same once. As terrible as this artifact is, it contains wonders. I would like to understand it as best I can. You tread a thin line, Altair. I know, but I have been ruined by curiosity, Maria. I want to meet the best minds, explore all the libraries of the world, and learn all the secrets of nature and the universe. All in one lifetime? It's a little ambitious. Who can say? It could be that one life is just enough. I love this a lot. His reflection on Al Mualim, his arc across Assassin's Creed 1 and on the Peace of Eden is just very earned after a game in which he grapples with all of these things. He reaches a point where he feels like he understands what he has to do next, and that's in part due to Maria seeing the truth of the world and deciding what she wanted for herself next. It's really meaningful in that way. She asks him where he'll go first, and he responds that he'll go east, which is nice. The game doesn't shove it in our face that they probably end up together, but it's very clear and implies that he wants to be in her company, and I really enjoy that. It's just a well-executed piece of dialogue that characterizes and informs the audience without being overt, and I'm a sucker for that. To speak of Altair's grappling though, there are six intervals across the game between each major block in which we see him sitting in a study with the apple, writing in a journal. If you've read the Codex pages in AC2, you'll be aware that this is what he's writing here. The Codex of which he discusses the purpose of one's life, the ones who came before and their designs upon the world, the use of the pieces of Eden, his dealings with Amualim, and all of this stuff is so good, so rich and interesting. This stuff is why I feel the game deserves to exist. It's the same reason I feel Valhalla deserves to exist, purely because we got those Desmond audio logs. Writing like that about the core themes of Assassin's Creed that don't just discuss major in-world events and concepts, but also inform character growth are so few and fleeting that I value them all so highly. And to just talk about one more scene, there's a moment on the boat to Kyrenia towards the start when Altair has Maria cuffed that I just really wanted to highlight because I think it's a really, really good scene. Did you study philosophy, Maria? I've read scraps, nothing more. The philosopher Empedocles preached that all life on Earth began simply, in rudimentary forms. Hands without arms, heads without bodies, eyes without faces. He believed that all these early forms combined, very gradually over time, creating all the variety of life we see before us. Interesting, hmm? <laughs> I don't see the point of your ramblings. Only a mind free of impediments is capable of grasping the chaotic beauty of the world. This is our greatest asset. But is chaos something to be celebrated? Is disorder a virtue? It presents us with challenges, yes, but freedom yields greater rewards than the alternative. The order and peace that the Templars seek requires servility and imprisonment. Hmm, I know the feeling. 
This is marvellous. It's just so good. Altair speaks of the philosopher Empedocles, and uses his studies as a means to explore the idea that only through free will could people truly appreciate the beauty in the diverse and chaotic nature of the world. Chaos isn't always a negative. Sure, it can be, with war and death and violence, but everything around us is chaos. Trees, birds, mountains, and the sea, it's all born of randomness, of chaos. And that chaos is only beauty to us because we have the free will to perceive it and give it meaning. A sunset is not beautiful unless there is somebody there to observe it. And that very thing is the foundation of what the assassins strive for. And you get to see a post-Assassin's Creed 1 Altair here speak with that confidence about the creed. I also really love how Maria uses this to get Altair to free her from her cuffs, because he realises what she's saying is true. She deserves to be free like anyone else. Keeping her bound goes against his very belief system. It's just a really nice scene that I think sums up the game nicely. Well, I think that covers it. If I had to leave you with something, I'd say never touch Altair's Chronicles, it's a disaster and has no redeeming qualities and is not worth your time. Give Bloodlines a go, maybe. Despite its faults, it's worth a replay just for the few moments I mentioned as well as the others that I didn't, but be prepared for a game that does test your patience a little bit. I think the most important thing though is that if you want to absorb the untold stories of Altair, just read The Secret Crusade. It's genuinely, I would say, a work of art. A truly incredible novel and it does the justice Altair deserves as a character with deep nuance and complexity. Altair may not have gotten the Ezio treatment with true sequels, but I think partially it's what makes him unique. He had one single game that keeps him very enigmatic, never showing his face or featuring him in a cutscene, and the rest of his stories were told in games like Bloodlines and Chronicles that feel very adjacent, or in novels like The Secret Crusade. Altair remains to this day an incredibly shadowy character, we're only really truly given glimpses into his life, and I think I want it to stay that way forever. You could remake Assassin's Creed 1 and in doing so remake the entire saga of his life, all of the stories that surround him, create a game that follows him from childhood to death, but to do so would remove a key component to what I feel makes Altair so compelling. He's the opposite of Ezio in a lot of ways, but it makes him just as interesting and well worth your time, if you're willing. Well, there you go. That's the video. That's about all I had to say on both these games. I hope you enjoyed. I really, really do. Thank you so much for tuning in to this video and the AC1 video. If you've not seen the AC1 video, it'll be linked down in the description. Making both of these has been a lot of work in a really short space of time because I set myself a deadline of April the 8th because I'm going away. I'm going to Italy for 10 days um, with, with my girlfriend the other. So I, I haven't had like, so I'm like, well, I don't want the project lingering over my head while I'm gone, I want to take a proper break. So I needed to get it all done before and I was kind of rushing to get it done, but at the same time, like not rush it. Like I was, I was, I was crunching is what I was doing. So you should all feel really sorry for me on Twitter, actually. I'm on a fucking Kotaku article written about how my boss is evil because I, I over, he overworked me. My boss is me, I'm evil, it's me. But seriously though, I, yeah, have absolutely worked way too hard. Um, And hopefully it was worth it. Hopefully you enjoyed both the videos. And when this is out, I'm going to be away, just chilling out and having a break, finally. Um, so that is going to be great. That is going to be absolutely great. I am going to film some of my time in Italy, and that'll go up on my vlog channel, Lasers Extra, uh, which I'll link down in the description. So if you want to you wanna see me be uh, super autistic um, and reference Assassin's Creed uh, continuously while being in Florence, then definitely subscribe to that channel. But in terms of main channel stuff, like I said on, on my AC1 video, like I'm planning the, the video on Kingdom Come Deliverance, a video on Tomb Raider, both at some point. But before that, I'll be doing a video on Burning Shores. I've had a lot of people ask me if I'm going to do one. I have like quite a big Horizon audience because like my Zero Dawn video and then my Forbidden West video. And so I've had people asking me if I'm going to do one. I am going to do a video on Burning Shores, which is going to be really fun. Um, I cannot wait to jump back into Aloy's, you know story and see what happens next because it's a sequel to forbidden west 2 so it takes place after got lance reddick's final performance of silence which is going to be an emotional one assuming silence is in burning shores which i assume he would be right i don't know but yeah that, those are the plans that's what's that's what's happening anyway thank you guys so much for joining me thanks for watching this video i really appreciate it i'll be back late april um for more bits and bobs working on new stuff i'll get back to streaming as well i want to stream re4 on twitch so come join me 
on Twitch for that. Give me, drop me a follow and I'll be back on Twitch. I uh, mean, I'll play it together like we do with every Resident Evil. So that'd be really cool. And that's it. Thank you everybody so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you to everybody on Patreon. Once again, thank you so much to everybody on Patreon. Both of these videos obviously went up early on Patreon, a decent bit early, so everyone who got to see it early and was giving me just like positive feedback was just, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much to, to everyone who's just being so kind, so nice, and, and, and saying, you know, they enjoyed the video and stuff. And as well, I I, I put up another episode of Jazz Lounge recently where I had Leo K on. Um, if you, you know, know anything about Assassin's Creed, if you're involved in Assassin's Creed, you've probably come across Leo K. We've never actually chatted before that episode. We've never actually spoken to each other. We've crossed paths, but we've never actually spoken directly to each other. So it was really fun to just sit down, have a chat, on a show like Jazz Lounge. So that's over on Patreon if you want to listen to that, as well as episodes with Robin Gaming and White Light so far. And I've got some interesting ones down the line to come. So that's going to be cool too. But thank you everybody on Patreon. And thank you very much to our Patreon producers. Cabbage, Arenathon, Connoisseur Sam is paying James's water bill, Damien the Not-So-Orange Gnome, Flash Paradox, TJ. And that's it. I just... I, I, I read it as if there was another name to come because usually there is another name at the bottom, but their their payment has either declined or they've cancelled it. So I, I um... anyway, once again, thank you very much. I'll let you go. See you later on. Have a good one. And uh, I'll see you soon for something new. Catch you later, everybody. Bye-bye.